So we're almost out of time. We got down to here, and I'm going to do a, a quick run through neural decoding. Because this method of looking at the patterns of response, even if in this case it turns out to be epiphenomenal, as I think it does, that ability to look in the brain and say not just what turns on, but what information is represented there is very important. Like, if we're going to do information processing models of mind and brain, we want to be able to see the information that's represented in each region. And the method that Haxby came up with is one that's been generalized to enable us to ask that question, and it's really important. Okay, so very quickly, if this doesn't work, we'll just go over it again later, but let me give it a, give it a whirl. Okay, so the idea is we want to be able to do neural decoding with functional MRI. So this is just a variant of what I already showed you. More generally, can you read the mind with functional MRI? Or in this case, at least, can you tell what the person was looking at to produce that functional MRI data? Okay, that's the, the low-tech version of this we're going to ask. Okay, so what you do is you design a decoder. You collect a bunch of MRI data and you design a decoder. So you scan the subject while they're looking at shoes. You collect functional MRI data. Here's a pattern of response over some region of the brain when the subject is looking at shoes. Okay? You scan them while they're looking at cats. And you get some other pattern in the same region of the brain. Okay, so now it's like we have brain templates for what happens in the brain when you see shoes, what happens in that same region when you see cats, or anything else. These are just dopey examples. Okay? Now that we've trained our decoder, now we can try to read out something new. Now we can test it. So now somebody puts in a mysterious stimu stimulus and doesn't tell us what it is and just gives us the brain data, and we have to say, was that person looking at shoes or cats? We can do that by taking the brain pattern and saying, does it look more like the pattern that you get when they're sh shoes or, or more like the pattern you get from cats? Okay, and if you do that, again, you can do that with any kind of method. You can just correlate the patterns just to say which one is it more similar to, or you can train fancy machine learning, s support vector machine, blah de blah whatever you want, fancy classifiers. Doesn't matter, same deal, okay? Just a way of saying, Based on this training with these patterns, now can we decode this by asking which one is more like? Okay? Okay. And in particular, if you get the correct answer and say it's a shoe, and it turns out that was presented, then your decoder passed the test. Everybody get the idea? Okay. So now, does that work? Answer is, it works a little bit. It worked a little bit, notice, in Haxby's experiment already. This is a generalization of his method. Right? So far it's the same, but you can do it with any stimulus, right? Um, but if this is freaking you out, don't panic, okay? It's not crazy to be freaked out by this, uh, but don't panic yet. Um, this is never going to work for compelling testimony. Around, uh, I don't know, eight or so years ago, all these lawyers got really worked up about how MRI was going to be used to compel testimony against people's um, first, uh, Fifth Amendment rights. And, uh, and so they convened panels of lawyers, and I would go around giving talks saying, oh, don't worry, there's a million ways to foil this. When we get MRI data that's any good at all, we celebrate, and there's a million ways to screw it up. So presumably nobody will ever attempt to compel te testimony from you. If they do, just move your head. If they've um, jammed your head in so you can't move it, move your tongue. Moving your tongue makes artifacts in the brain. They won't be able to read out your brain data. There's a million, close your eyes. There's a million ways to foil this. Do a lot of mental arithmetic. Any of those things will um, change the signal and prevent this from working. Okay? So this is really a tool that's of some use for science. It's not, you know, so far, and I think, you know, for the indefinite future, uh, of use for anything else. Okay, so there's many versions of this. Let me generalize it a little bit. I gave you the case where you collect MRI data and make these MRI templates that you can then use to read out what was being seen. But we can also do this with other kinds of data. With monkey neurophysiology, you could collect the responses to a whole bunch of neurons and get a pattern. Then the pattern wouldn't be a pattern of response across voxels. It would be a firing rate for each neuron in the sample of 100 or 200 neurons. Okay, Very much the same idea just measures across neurons instead of measures across voxels. And you could do all the same stuff in the monkey. Okay? Or you can use magnetoencephalography with these 300 and some sensors around the head, and you can just get a 306-dimensional representation of the neural response to each stimulus. But because it's MEG and you have time information, actually you could do this with neurons as well, 
you could get those templates at each time point after the stimulus came on. All of these are ways of getting uh, multidimensional neural data to give us a template of how do those neurons respond, whether MRI voxels, batches of single neurons in a monkey brain, or MEG sensors, or lots of other things as well, and then using those as templates to decode subsequently collected neural data. Does everybody get how this is kind of a general way you can decode neural data from the brain? And this is really important because this is what we want to know from the brain. We want to know not just when does a region turn on a lot. That's fine, but that's kind of baby stuff. We want to know what's represented there. And this is a way to say, does that region contain information about this distinction, that distinction, the other distinction? Does it know, for example, that it's the same face if you look at it this way and if you look at it that way? Right? All of those are questions we can now ask with this method. Everybody get the, how neural decoding is not just like, you know, a scary thing that some futuristic society might do to its citizens, but a powerful scientific tool to ask just the questions we want to answer about how representation works in the brain. Okay, I can make one more point and then let you go. Okay, and this, this is the correlation version, but again, you can use all kinds of fancy machine learning methods to do fancy versions of this. So far, in most labs, it doesn't make that much difference, but whatever. Okay, now let's compare these two methods, functional MRI and um, uh, single unit response. So let's compare the power of these two methods. Okay, so Dubois et al. published a paper recently where they did that. They did this in monkeys. Remember, there's six face selective patches in monkeys. There they are. They looked at one of those face selective patches, and they asked what information about faces is represented in that region. They asked that, they did that by showing lots of different pictures of faces to the monkeys but they measured two kinds of data. In one, they stuck their electrodes in that region, and they recorded the responses from 167 neurons to each of five different faces, okay? In the other case, they took the same monkeys, popped them in the scanner, and measured the MRI response from about 100 different voxels in the same region of the brain to the same five faces, okay? In both cases, they then apply pattern decoding methods to ask what kind of face information is present in that region of the brain, either as measured with single units or measured with functional MRI. And what they found was with single units, they could decode the identity of the face presented, and with functional MRI, they could not. That sucks for people like me. If you're a monkey physiologist, good for you. If you're studying humans where you can't stick those electrodes in there, what that means is, once again, pattern decoding methods are fabulous when they work, but if you go and you look for pattern information in a part of the brain and you don't find it, in this case, we know it was there because they found it with the high resolution method of recording from individual neurons. And nonetheless, they could not find it with functional MRI. So it's just a big important caveat that sometimes information, patterns of information across the brain are represented at as crude enough spatial profile that you can see it with functional MRI. And sometimes the information's in there, and you can't see it, because you don't have the resolution to see those patterns. Okay, and then further, as I showed with the brain stimulation case, even when you see the patterns, you have a question about whether they're playing a role in behavior. Sometimes they aren't. 